Good morning. Let's pray this morning. Father, you, uh, it's your word. You wrote it to us. And uh, this morning as we come to it, we, uh, uh, my prayer is that we can treat it as just that your word, your holy inspired word, and that we can hold it in reverent fear and live our lives by it. Uh, we thank you for giving us your scriptures. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. People are destined to die once, and after that, face judgment. That's not a good way to start a sermon. That is, that is like, I bring that one up, Sean. That is definitely not a good way uh, to start a sermon, to talk about judgment and to talk about death. Those are two, like, you know, you, in all the college classes, Bible college classes, they said you want to grab a hold of your audience's attention, not encourage your audience to grab a hold of their stuff and leave. Uh, but uh, I, I think this is appropriate. People are destined to die once, and after that, face judgment. You don't want to hear destined to die. Nobody wants to be told that they're going to die. We live our lives as if we're invincible, as if we're not going to die. I'll give you some examples. Sunscreen. Okay, I'm guilty, all right? I'm invincible. I don't need sunscreen. You, you're guilty too. I see it. You, that's why you're going to South Carolina all the time. Uh, yeah, we don't need sunscreen. We don't need that stuff. How about uh, the way we drive our vehicles? Eh? You, you know, motorcycle, highway, no helmet, 120. That's not a good idea. He's convinced he's going to live forever. Or Green County, I love it, first day of deer season. Like, that's just, a, I don't understand it. Everything shuts down. Everybody goes in the woods and brings guns. That's a great idea. Maybe not. But we, we don't think we're going to die. We think we're invincible. We've got life figured out and we're not going to die. But this says that we're all going to die. And last time I checked, everybody I've ever known is going to die. And everybody, it's just 100%. I apologize. I mean, it's very awkward to talk about that. But that's, that's how it is. That's how life is. We're all going to die. And as we talk about hell, I appreciated what, uh, what someone said. I'm going to save their name for a bit of embarrassment. But last week, they came up to me and they said, that was a bad sermon. And I said, thank you. Because it was. We're talking about hell. We've been talking about hell and, and judgment and the end of the world and the end of your life for, for three weeks now, and it's depressing. It's not fun, but it's true. This is a Bible verse. If you've got your Bibles, I want you to open them up. Open up to Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. Today we're going to be talking about the fact that we all will die once, and after that, face judgment. Nobody likes to talk about death. Nobody likes to talk about being judged. Have you ever heard someone come up to you and say, I just love it when you judge me. I love it when you criticize my actions. That, you know, maybe your husband has said that to you. I just I love it. It's so good. No, we don't say that. But this is the truth found in the scriptures. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. If you've got a church Bible, it's on page 973. Chapter 9, verse 27. Uh, and it says this, Just as people are destined to die once, and after that, to face judgment. So Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many, and he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. We are all going to, to die. But I love that, that, that verse. Uh, look at it again. Just as people are destined to die once, and after that, it seems kind of funny, because usually after you die, nothing happens. I mean, you're just, you're dead. It's done. That puts you in a box, in the ground, game over. But see, we believe that something happens, that our soul leaves here. Last week we were talking about this. Is it soul sleep? No. Is it purgatory? No. Our soul goes to heaven, or our soul goes to hell. But it goes somewhere. Uh, this verse says it right here. After that, we go to face judgment. It goes somewhere. And so the rest of the verse, this is what I like, that Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many. Think about that for a second. Think about the, 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 the importance of Christ, one sacrifice. One act of, of, of giving by one man covers the sins of everybody behind and everybody forward, all of them. That's a lot. 
That must have been a pretty valuable person. That must have been a pretty valuable sacrifice. That was God's son. And that's what God did for us. He, he sacrificed his son to pay the price for our wrongs. Sean, you're a, you're a police officer. And so I want to ask you this question right in front of everybody. It may be a little embarrassing. Have you ever pulled somebody over and gave them a speeding ticket? Yeah, okay. What's the fine for a speeding ticket? Let's say you're 15 miles an hour over the limit. What's, the, what's that cost? 160 bucks? Shoot, man. 160 160, oh, okay, that's my, all right, 160. So you write them a ticket and you say, you were speeding, here's your ticket, my job is to serve and protect, you've just been served. Um, have you ever looked at that person and had so much, she would have grace, grace, had so much grace and compassion that you gave them the ticket and you said, I just love you and pulled out your checkbook and wrote a check for 160 bucks and say, God bless you, have a good day. Have you done that? Would your wife beat you if you did that? <laughs> that? We don't do that. Like, if you're doing something wrong, you're going to pay the price for it. I have two brothers. I'm the middle one. We're all separated by a year. Okay? If my brothers did anything wrong, my parents didn't have to find it. I, I helped. You know? I, Mom, Dad, as soon as you come in the house, I'm going to show you what my brother, Jason, Tim, whoever, broke. And I'm going to explain in details how I was on the other side of the house. Why? I won't get in trouble. But God looks at us and says, here's your speeding ticket. Here's what you did wrong. And I'll pay the fine. I'll give you my son as a sacrifice. I'll make him take the punishment for your sins. One act of one man, Jesus Christ, on the cross. And so Jesus pays our price for it. And, and I think sometimes uh, we, we, we focus too much on, on here. And we don't focus on the rest of what's going to happen. We focus too much on, on what's happening here in life. Have you seen this, uh, this text message lingo? Bring that up. This is, uh, this is YOLO or YOLA or whatever. I don't, I'm not cool enough to know what this means. Okay, This is what the kids text. I'm not that young. Uh, and I had asked some of the college kids last year. I was like, what does that mean? I see it here and there. What does it mean? They said that means you only live once. See, we would call that an acronym, but that's not what they say. That, whatever. YOLO. You only live once. And I guess there's some importance to it. When we were on vacation, I saw a bunch of people with shirts that said YOLO and, and, and some songs on the radio that focus on this. And it's the idea that we're only going to live today once, so we need to make the most of it. You know, we've only got one shot at today, so really, you know, live it up. Okay, maybe, yeah, okay, I get it. But think about this for a second. I have had, in my 32 years of being alive, I've had 1,000 679 Sundays, I think, ish. I didn't really count them all. That's an estimate. But I got about 1,679 Sundays. What are my probable chances of having another Sunday next week? Pretty high. I mean, yeah, I could lose my life. Something could happen. But if the rate continues as it's going, I haven't skipped a Sunday in 1,679 times. I'll probably have next Sunday, too, and I'll probably have another Sunday after that and another Sunday after that. And, yeah, there are opportunities I might miss, but chances are pretty high I'll probably have another day. So I don't really think we need to be focused on the fact that we only live once. I think we need to focus on this fact. We only die once. That's too close to Yoda, but you get what I'm saying. You're only going to die once. And after that, what's the verse say? After you die, you face judgment. That's scary. After we die, after we leave this earth, regardless of what we do on Sunday or Thursday, 2,654, whatever number it is, whatever we do here, we will die and we will stand before the Creator God and He will look at us and say, what did you do with my son? Did you follow him? Or did you do whatever you wanted to do? Did you accept the sacrifice that I gave to you from my son? Or did you ignore him? See, the days here, those aren't the ones that really scare me. I mean, yeah, they're scary. But that day, that moment in time, when I stand before God, that should strike some holy fear in our hearts. I think we as a church... In general, church in general, I'll say that. I think we've done a disservice to the gospel because I think what we've done is we've taken the gospel message of Jesus Christ and we've done this with it. Okay, so I'm going to 
build something here. I like building things. What we do is we say, the message of Jesus Christ is like this, okay? So imagine you've got two guys on a plane, all right? Two guys on a plane. And the stewardess comes up to the first guy on the plane, and she goes, here, this is a parachute. Actually, this is a backpack with my running shoes in it. But for today, this is a parachute. So the guy says, okay. So he takes the parachute. He puts it on. And she says, that parachute will help to improve your flight. He thinks, okay, all right. Put the parachute on. Don't really know who's flying the plane, but whatever. So he puts it on. He sits down and he thinks, well, that's not very comfortable. So he's kind of squirming in his seat to find a good way to sit because he's got this big parachute on. It's probably good enough. Then he notices it's kind of cutting into his shoulders. And he's thinking, this is supposed to improve my life, my flight? Then he's squirming some more. And then he notices that there's a guy up there and he's turned around and he's kind of looking at him. He's doing this. What's he doing? And then there's another lady over here with the phone taking a picture. And you're like, oh, come on. You squirm some more, and then they start to snicker. At this point, he's getting annoyed. And he looks at me, he says, hey, turn around, okay? Just mind your own business. Now he's getting frustrated. He gets up, takes the parachute off, throws it down. He says, that didn't improve my life. That didn't improve my flight. I'm done with it. I don't want any more of it. And he's done. He sits back down. I'm looking like everybody else. I fit in. Good. Now, the second guy on the plane, the stewardess comes up, hands him a parachute, and says, at any moment on this flight, you're going to be required to jump out of the plane. We're traveling at 25,000 feet. Here's a parachute. He's going to go, I thought we were going to Chicago, but I'm going to take this parachute, and I'm going to put it on. And there is no chance that this is coming off. And it doesn't matter how uncomfortable this is. He knows that at some moment in this flight, he's going to be required to jump from the plane. He's looking at everybody else going, dude, you're acting the fool. I'm not, you're on your own on this one. This is mine. Don't touch it. That's the gospel message of Jesus Christ. See this whole, oh, Jesus will help you in life. Jesus will help you become rich. He'll help you grow more hair. It's not working. I'm trying all these nice things that, that Jesus will do. Yeah, he will. He can bring some peace in your life. He can bring some joy. He can bring some, some blessings. But those blessings, think about it for a second. Are those blessings more important than salvation? I mean, Jesus could hook me up with tons of cash. But if he doesn't save me on that day, what's all the money do? That's a waste. And so when we talk about the gospel message of Jesus Christ, it's not Jesus will improve your life. It's Jesus will save you on that day. That one day we will stand before God and the holy divine creator of the universe will say, what did you do with my son? The rest of the verse there at the end, look at chapter 9. The last part, verse 28. So Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many. Christ has taken them away. They're gone. And he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Christ is coming with salvation. I'm not afraid. I mean, yes, I am afraid in the holy, reverent fear of standing before God. But I'm not afraid in the fact that I have Jesus Christ's blood on my life. And so I can stand there with confidence and say, I accepted your son as my personal Lord and Savior. And I followed him with my life. So I've got my parachute on. And I'm not worried, and I slip into everyday living, and I become complacent, and I just go about life minding my own business. We do that, you know? We're saved, we're Christians, everything's good, and we just kind of slip into neutral, and we forget about what our mission is. I remember an afternoon back in uh, northwest Indiana, September, mid-September, uh, and my wife and I where we lived in northwest Indiana, this was before we had kids. Lots of hair, carefree, no worries, okay? And uh, 
So in Northwest Indiana, the, the Lake Michigan was right, like 15 minutes away. And so we went there all the time. We had our summer beach pass, just showed up, flashed the beach pass, went in. And uh, it's beautiful. If you went east, you had seven miles of just water, sand, and trees, just beautiful nature. If you went west, you had steel mills and Gary. So you just always went east, okay? But I remember one day, we were out there, and uh, got a mess up here. And I'm standing on the edge of the water, and, and I went to wash my glasses because they were sandy or sweaty or whatever. And I'm, I get them wet, and I'm, and I'm washing them off. And as I'm standing there washing the waters, and the water's cold because it's mid-September, it's, it's, it's northwest Indiana. As I'm, as I'm sit, standing back up and I put my glasses on, I look out in the distance, and there's two guys out in the lake, and they're going crazy. And it's not like we're having fun. They're, they're drowning. And, I, and I'm thinking, Really? And they're yelling, help, help. And I see hands and, and, and heads. And, and they're farther than normal. And I looked at them and I thought, you're joking. You're totally pulling my leg. I'm not going to jump in this ice cold water, swim out there, and then have you stand up on a sandbar and be like, ha, ha, ha. I'm not doing that. I'm smarter than you. You guys are, you're just pulling my leg. Next thing you know, someone just knocks me over. Because somebody realized they're not joking. And they're about to lose their life. So my right shoulder gets hit. My left shoulder gets hit. People are running as fast as they can in the water. And I'm standing there, and it dawns on me that they're going to lose their life. And I did nothing about it. I'm, I'm tall. I'm like 6'4". I could have walked. These guys were short. I could have walked out there and just be like, hi, and just lifted them up. I didn't have to swim. But the water's cold. I thought maybe they were pulling a joke on me. They were about to lose their life, and I did nothing. What do we do with our friends who are about to lose their life? Do we stand by and just complacently watch and say, well, I don't want to make it awkward. Well, the timing isn't right. Or do we speak up about Jesus Christ? Are we the slightest bit concerned about our friends? See, those guys in the lake, at least they knew that they were going down. And so they were signaling for help. That was the only thing they had left. But the worst part about our friends, a lot of our friends, our families, those who live down the street, they don't even realize that they're lost. Are we concerned? Are we going to do something about it? Brian Jones is the preacher at the Christ Church of the Valley Christian Church. And he wrote a book uh, called Hell is Real, but I hate to admit it. And this, this series that we've been going through, we've been studying that and, and, and the scriptures and, and looking at it. And he calls this uh, apocalyptic urgency. And it was a lot of fun because Darlene asked me this week, she said, what's the name of this sermon? I said, apocalyptic urgency. And she goes, no, really? I said, no, I'm serious. That's the name of the sermon. She goes, do you know how to spell that? I was like, no, I have to look it up every time I write it. But th th that's what it is. And so Brian Jones says, it's apocalyptic urgency. It's an all-consuming conviction that overtakes you when you realize that hell is real, that people will stand before God and spend eternity separated from him, and that it is within our power to help anyone avoid going there. I'll say that again. An all-consuming conviction that overtakes you when you realize that hell is real and that it's within your power to help people avoid going there. Apocalyptic urgency. Urgency. Think about it. Let's break it down. The word apocalyptic, meaning a cosmic, you know, the end of the ages. You know, the, everything's destroyed, the end of the ages. But what if we think about apocalyptic in your life? See, if we're all going to die 100% accuracy, then we will all stand to face God in judgment. We will all have that moment of truth where he says, what did you do with my son? And it makes me somewhat, let me rephrase that, it makes me incredibly concerned that there are people around here that may not know who Jesus Christ is. They may not have him as his personal Lord and Savior. This morning when I, when I practiced this sermon, I, I rode home real quick, drove home real quick to get something. And as I'm driving my car, I'm looking at people and I, you look at them different. You see, hey, that guy helped me move a, a sheet of plywood once. I don't even know his name. I just asked him to help out. He's a good guy. Does he know Jesus? That's my neighbor. Do they know Jesus? 
And it changes the way you look at people. Do we have apocalyptic urgency? Do we want to do something now about those around us? If I could go back in time, go all the way back to northwest Indiana, where, where me is standing, I slap myself in the face so hard. There's somebody who's going to lose their life. And you stand there and go, well, it's going to cost getting cold and wet. Really? Is there any cost greater than sharing the faith? Well, it'll cost time. You might think I'm crazy. Does it matter? We have the message of Jesus Christ, the hope to bring to the nation. Are we going to do something about it? If you've got your Bibles, go back a couple pages. Go to Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9. We're in Hebrews. Just back a couple pages. Page 917 in the church Bibles. Romans chapter 9, verse 2 through 3. It says, we talk about this, um, I, I want two things. Like as we talk about hell, part of me feels uh, nauseous, and that's good. Part of me feels convicted to do something. That's better. And there's a big part of me that feels grateful for what Jesus Christ did on the cross. Because I, under, I start to understand what Jesus saves us from. And so we go to Romans chapter 2, or chapter 9, verse 2 through 3. Some background information here. If you were a Jewish reader and you were reading this letter that Paul wrote, you would be furious at this point. If you made it to chapter 9, you would be absolutely furious with Paul. Paul was a Jew. Paul was one of your guys. He used to persecute Christians. Now he's switched sides. Now he's promoting Christianity. So that makes you mad. Uh, he is uh, inviting Gentiles to be in the faith. Paul, hello, we're God's chosen people. You can't invite the Gentiles. God's changed it up a little bit here. We can. You're mad at him because he's already told you that you're going to be the focus of God's wrath and judgment. You're mad because he said that righteousness comes apart from the law, the law that you love. So you're, you're irritated at Paul in the slightest bit. Paul says this in chapter 9, verse 1. Uh, I speak the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience confirms it through the Holy Spirit. In other words, listen, I'm telling you the truth. This is my heart here. Verse 2. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my people, those of my own race, his race, the Jewish people. Paul says, I am filled with unceasing anguish and great sorrow. Paul says, I'd rather be cursed from Christ, cut off from Christ. Whoa, does that mean Paul would rather be in hell? Would Paul pay the price and go to hell if it could save the Jewish people? Of course, we know that that's not possible, okay? And as you read through different scholars that, that were talking about this passage, some say Paul's just using a hyperbole. He's just exaggerating the thing, that he would go to any length to save their lives. Jack Cottrell says he's actually using the same Greek words that mean spend eternity in hell. So, Whatever it is, if it's a hyperbole or if it actually means I'd like to go to hell for these people, Paul's heart is filled with verse 2. Great sorrow and unceasing anguish. His heart's breaking for lost people. His heart's breaking for the Jews. Wait, the Jews? The Jewish people. Keep your finger here. Go back to Acts. A couple, couple pages to the left. Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. Unpack this for a second, okay? So if we go back to Acts chapter 9, and we're going to pick up the read in verse 20, uh, 3, 23. Listen to this. Uh, this is after Paul, who at this time is named Saul, is converted to Christ. He, he's seen the bright light in the road. He's telling people about Jesus. Uh, chapter 9 of Acts, verse 23. After many days had gone by, there was a conspiracy among the, the Jews to hug Paul. No, to kill him. They don't want to have a party. They want to find him and kill him because he's teaching about Jesus. Verse 24. But Saul learned of their plan. Day and night they kept close watch in the city gates in order to, to kill him. But his followers took him by night and lowered him in a basket through an opening in the wall. These people are trying to kill him. All throughout ministry, all throughout Paul's ministry, they're, they're getting in his way. They're being a roadblock to him. They're abusing him. They're persecuting him. They want to end his ministry. And what's his response to them? My heart breaks for you. I'm filled with great sorrow. I'm filled with great, unceasing anguish. 
This isn't just like, oh, that's sad. I wish I could do something about it. This consumes his life. See, we feel that kind of sad pity all the time. How many of you have walked into Walmart recently and seen the, the high school kids outside shaking buckets? You know, like the cheerleading squads out there, the football teams out there, and they're like, help, we won't have a football program. We won't have cheerleader pom-poms. And really, they don't even shake the bucket. They just text message until you get really close, and they're like, oh, hi. And I think to myself, oh, I feel really bad for you. Yeah, right, whatever. I, I, I might find like the slightest bit of sorrow, but I won't lose any sleep. And I know if they paid me some money, they could rip my kids and they'd make a killing because my kids are so much cuter. Um, but that's just like little pity. You know, I'm not going to lose sleep because, of, sorry, the cheerleaders don't have enough funding. I apologize if that's offensive to you. I will lose sleep because people don't know who Jesus Christ is. I do lose sleep because people don't know who Jesus Christ is. Because I, I hear verse 2, great sorrow and unceasing anguish. I pray that God breaks my heart for the people that I look around and I see. I pray that he helps me have a heart like his heart that doesn't see people and get annoyed at them. These people are killing Paul. They're trying to. And he prays for them. That's patience. That's apocalyptic urgency. It's pretty amazing. And so we look at the, uh, the life that Paul lives as he goes his entire life to reach people for Christ. Does it encourage us to have the same urgency to find those outside of Christ and bring them in? I appreciate it as I was reading through Francis Chan, another preacher, in his book about uh, erasing hell. In a part there, it seems like he, he totally gets lost because he's, he's writing all this great theological stuff and all of a sudden he just goes, I want to scrap this whole book. I'm thinking, what? He goes, I'm about two seconds away from hitting control all, highlighting everything, and deleting the whole thing. He goes, I'm sitting in a Starbucks right now, writing this book out on my laptop. And as I sit here, I look to the left. There's a lady with a newspaper. I look to the right. There's two guys drinking coffee. There's the person who's making the coffee, the employee at Starbucks. And it hits him. Do they know who Jesus Christ is? Where will they spend eternity? What about her? And he goes, should I be writing a book about where they'll go? Or should I be building relationships with them to show them Jesus Christ? Well, he finished the book. But you get the point. What, what will we sacrifice to share Jesus Christ with others? What will we give? Do we have apocalyptic urgency? You don't have to call it that. I can't spell that word, okay? It's tricky to say. Maybe you could just say, my heart breaks for the lost. Maybe you could just say, I want people to know who Jesus Christ is. I know him. I'm not afraid to stand on the day of judgment and say, I've accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. So our responsibility is to get out there and to, to share the faith. We're going to talk about this, uh, sharing our faith next week again. We've got two parts here. But this is your assignment for this week. I want you to really spend some time thinking about and praying about the three people. I want you to pick three people, at least three. If you've got more, that's good. I want you to pick three people in your life that you want to invest in, that you want to pray for, that you diligently want to just pray and just pray and work, uh, see God work in their life. Maybe you go and you, you have them over for dinner. Whatever it is, I want you to pick three people and start praying about them. And if you, if you get your three people this afternoon, you feel like call me, call me up. Tell me about them. If you're going to call me later on in the week, call me up. We will pray on the spot. Actually, I'll probably get a voicemail because I've lost my phone. But when I find it, I will call you and we will pray for your friends. And we will pray that God will work in their hearts. And we will pray that God will work in our hearts. Because I want us, I want our church to be a church that's filled with people, more so than it already is, filled with people that have great sorrow and unceasing anguish for those who are outside of Christ. Because we know, we know that one day all of us will die and will stand in judgment. And on that day, we will accept, those who accepted Christ will be set free, will get to go to heaven. And those who did not, I don't want to talk about that. 
Let's get our work done. Let's get out there. Let's bring them in.